I want to provide a brief overview of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002. Now, this is a regulatory bill following a number of accounting scandals, including Enron and WorldCom. And like many bills that uh, get enacted, it's named for the sponsor in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. And the senator who sponsored it was Paul Sarbanes, a Democrat from Maryland. And in the House, it was uh, Representative Michael Oxley, Republican from Ohio. And it was pr approved by an overwhelming majority, okay, 40, 423 votes in favor in the House, with three opposed and eight abstaining, and by the Senate with a vote of 99 in favor and one abstaining. Now, basically, this has uh, 11 titles, okay, a lot of times they like to put these titles in. You may have heard of Title IX, sometimes you hear about these things. Well, this. Um, has 11 titles, and let's look briefly at these 11 titles. Title I uh, establishes a Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, PCAOB, sometimes it's abbreviated, uh, provides independent oversight of public accounting firms providing audit services. Title II deals with auditor independence. It establishes standards for external auditor independence to limit conflicts of interest. What it does is it restricts auditing companies from providing non-audit services for the same client. Up to this point in time, it was very common for a firm that did the auditing, a firm that was checking the financial statements of a company, to also provide lucrative consulting services. Now, they may have been different people working there, but there's a conflict of interest. I mean, if your company's taking in millions of dollars in consulting services, uh, there's going to be some pressure on the auditors to rubber stamp whatever management um, reports. Okay, and that's not the point of the auditor. The point of the auditor is to check and to make sure things are, that there are no mistakes, but also that there's no fraud involved. Title III deals with corporate responsibility and it mandates that senior executives take individual responsibility for the accuracy and completeness of corporate financial reports. Again, this would seem to be common sense, but up until this point in time, many CEOs just simply said, well, you know, I wasn't aware of that. Well, you know, they're the top person, and this, this act requires that they assume responsibility. Title IV, Enhanced Financial Disclosures, um, enhanced reporting requirements for financial transactions, including off-balance sheet transactions, pro forma figures, and stock transactions of corporate officers. Okay, Some of the problems that occurred for companies like Enron, and not problems, but um, that made it difficult for uh, analysts to understand what the company was doing is they had a lot of off-balance sheet transactions, things that didn't have to be reported on the balance sheet. They may have been reported in a little footnote. They may not have been reported at all, even though these impose significant liabilities on the company. Title V deals with analyst conflicts of interest, defines the codes of conduct for securities analysts, and requires disclosure of knowable conflicts of interest. Again, seems to make sense, but they put it into law. Uh, Title VI uh, deals with commission resources and authority, uh, defines practices to restore investor confidence in securities analysts, defines the SEC's authority to censure or bar securities professionals from practice, and it defines conditions under which a person can be barred from practicing as a broker advisor or dealer. Title VII studies and reports requires the Comptroller General and the SEC to perform various studies and report their findings. Title VIII corporate and criminal fraud accountability describes specific criminal penalties for manipulation, destruction, or alteration of financial reports or other interference with investigations while providing certain protections for whistleblowers, whistleblowers being those people who report uh, criminal fraud. <clears throat> Title IX, white-collar crime and penalty enhancement, 
increases the criminal penalties associated with white, white collar crimes and conspiracies, uh, recommends stronger sentencing guidelines, and specifically adds failure to certify corporate financial reports as a criminal offense. Title 10, uh, corporate tax returns, states that the CEO should sign the company tax return. And the last title, Title 11, Corporate Fraud Accountability, identifies corporate fraud and records tampering as criminal offenses and joins those offenses to specific penalties, revises sentencing guidelines and strengthens their penalties, and also enables the SEC to resort to temporarily freezing transactions or payments that have been deemed large or unusual. Now, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, despite its overwhelming support, you know, has its detractors because it's a very costly, it can be very costly to corporations. There are corporations that have, have had to hire, you know, numerous individuals to file all the paperwork that's required of Sarbanes-Oxley. So it makes it, makes it being, it makes it very expensive to be a public company. Um, but some of these things make a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of these laws get passed simply because of public outcry. It came after a, a major crisis with a lot, a lot of accounting fraud, and therefore these uh, people in Congress, these senators and congressmen, um, felt they needed to support this, um, this legislation. Although, again, it still has its detractors and, um, you know, the, the, the record is still out on this. You know, many people would say this is, this is good. Some people say that this holds back corporations, adds a lot of cost, has cost jobs, et cetera. But this is at least a, a brief overview of what the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act is.